Scott, Dorothy, thank you for joining us today. Congratulations um, on the show. I finished watching it on the, on the way here. I think it's really interesting, really thought-provoking exploration of not just climate change, but memory, loss, capitalism, our relationship with, uh, with technology. Um, and it's just a really interesting sort of mashup of genres. It's like a really interesting Apple TV, everyone. Go and watch it after, um, after, after this panel. Um, but I'd like to frame this conversation a little bit around climate storytelling. So I'm an editor at Bloomberg Green, and we obviously talk a lot, you know, spend all of our time thinking about uh, climate storytelling. And it feels like, we talked about this earlier, there's like 100 hospital shows, there's 100 police procedural shows. Why is it that until now we haven't really had many shows of any shows about climate change? Scott, or Dorothy, do you? Yeah, um, I'll jump in. I mean, I think part of it is because people who really didn't want a fast green energy transition spent a lot of time and money making the question for 20 years, do you believe in climate change? Um, and there was a really focused, well-funded, well-orchestrated, brilliant campaign to make it a controversial question that mostly lived in this kind of ineffable realm. Like, we believe or don't believe in Santa Claus, right? Like, <laughs> that's the kind of conversation we were having about climate change. And that's not an interesting TV show. Two people arguing, do we, I believe, well, I don't believe. Well, but I believe, well, but I don't believe is, is incredibly boring and you can't, you know, cut to commercial and have people come back um, and want to see what happens next. So I think our whole understanding of how we talk about climate change was really framed by this notion that it is controversial and unknowable, uh, when in fact it is happening. <laughs> and you know, there are a million stories you can tell, but you have to accept the premise to begin with that it is real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for us, the, the exercise was no longer how do you, how do you deal with climate deniers, I think. You know, years ago when we made an inconvenient truth, that was something we had to contend with. Now, what we were more interested in was how do we live through this? What does life look like? Um, what does it look like to raise a child? What does it look like to go to work in the morning? Um, and so we wanted to go from sort of this question of is there climate change or not to, the, you know, this is something we're all living with, so let's start telling stories about it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think one of the most interesting aspects of the show is like how you talk about technology, and we'll, we'll get back to that um, in a moment. But you know, one of the, again, coming from the journalistic perspective, um, you know, one of the challenges with telling stories about climate is that it can be seen as very kale and broccoli. It's something that no one really wants to think about that much, and sort of the nitty gritties of it are, you know, it's rooted in you know the solution, the cause, and the solutions are rooted in science. When you were pitching the show, like, was that a problem for you to sort of persuade the potential funders that actually, no, this can be really interesting and, and, and exciting? Well, first of all, I really wish that I could somehow disabuse people of this kale and broccoli thing. No. <laughs> you know, stories are stories, and you know, they're filled with people, and I want to believe that you can tell a cool story about anything. And I also want us to start questioning, why did we get to a place where the prevalent narrative is that this is kale and broccoli or that it's too big or too hard. We don't seem to give up in the face of other things quite so quickly, but yet in the media, we constantly are hearing this is so big and then it's not surprising that a five-year-old child will look at its mom and say, I don't know what to do. So first thing that I think we wanted to do was sort of call into question the origins and the purveyors of the narrative, that the, the kale narrative. Um, I think the second part is, and this was really encouraging, um, Apple was not the only buyer um, that responded <clears throat> to our pitch. There were actually three really legit buyers, um, and there were two other streamers that expressed a lot of interest but were developing climate shows of their own. So this wasn't, you know, this wasn't the uphill battle public service announcement that I am very suspicious of being connected mm -hmm. to the kale narrative. So 
I think those two things are, are, are one and the same and that we need to, to get beyond that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just say on, on the subject of kale, um, no disrespect to kale, um, you know, we're currently living in a 1.1 degree Celsius climate changed world. Um, we know for a fact because of our lives that people living in climate change like go to bars, uh, tell jokes, ha have fights with their parents, have sex. Like those things all happen in climate change because we did them earlier today. Like so the idea that a TV show about climate change would just be a bunch of people like looking at a graph and frowning um, <laughs> is not true. Like, you know. Well, we do a lot of that at Bloomberg Green. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, we are in our show, people are, you know, making food for their kids and, you know, trying to get to work and trying to earn a living and falling in love and all the things that we all do. And I think that was the most important thing for me and Scott was that it is something that is going to happen that people will live through and they will live like people do through any other kind of challenge. So climate is like the backdrop to all of these other sort of human stories taking place, yeah. Yeah, you know, Dorothy is fond of saying, and I've stolen it so many times, and now I'm going to do it right in front of you, <laughs> um, that it's the shows that pretend that the climate isn't changing, um, the ones that manage to ignore it season after season. Those are actually the science fiction shows. Mm. Um, our show really tried to deal with the reality of what's going on, and then the experiment for us was, so think about your favorite story, you know, whether it's Hamlet or Charlotte's Web or whatever it is. How does that story change in, you know, in a climate changed world? And the other thing is climate change doesn't look the same everywhere you go. Um, and we wanted the show to be very far flung for that reason. It's a really different experience if you're living in a coastal community that's dealing with sea level rise than if you're dealing, if you're living in a farming community where there is no rain and there's drought and your farm is failing and now there's huge human migration going on. So, you know, we wanted to, to look at all of these aspects and hopefully get people to start looking, you know, beyond Bloomberg Green as just being where they might find this and start looking for it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And one, one of the most distinctive aspects of the show, and much commented on, of course, is the star-studded cast. You've got Meryl Streep, who, who voices, at one point voices a, a whale, and is also the mother of Sienna Miller, who's in, who's in the show, Edward Norton. Um, can you talk us a little bit through the process of getting all of, all of those wonderful people on board? Yeah, look, uh, you know, all of the people in our show um, have choices. They're, you know, Meryl had a lot of other things she could have done. Um, so I hope part of the reason that they said yes was because they care about this issue as, as passionately as Dorothy and I do. But I also hope that like any piece of, of entertainment and any character they're going to play, they saw something on the page that they wanted to inhabit. And one of the really gratifying things for us was you meet, you know, people like Yara Shahidi who is, is an activist and a miraculous human being on every level. Um, so there were people who were at that stage of their development, but there are also people, you know, like Kit Harrington, who would say that he cared about this, but he didn't know as much. Mm. And so we became, you know, kind of a, a, a really great group of people where we could talk about this and there were different levels of expertise mm -hmm. that people brought with them. Okay. Um, so yeah, I wanna, I wanna talk about technology and how it's portrayed um, in, the, you know, in, in the series. Um, you know, it looks, well, certainly the rich people, the people living in the richer part of the world uh, are living in this, in some ways, it looks like a beautiful Steve Jobs-like universe with hologram watches and beautiful clean interiors. And then poorer people, I think episode five, which is set in India, are living in this sort of Mad Max hellscape. And I think, you know, to, to your point, different people experiencing climate change in a different way. But I think there's a, also a deeper philosophical engagement with the question of, of tech and capitalism um, in solving the climate crisis and again bringing it back to Bloomberg Green. That's, we write a lot about that, the role of technology, the role of capitalism 
um, um, in, in solving the climate crisis. And I think that's particularly brought out in the clip that I want to I show here. I'll just introduce it a little bit before we show it. So in the scene we're about to see, I think it's episode four, um, and a scientist played by Indira Varma, she's, sort of high, she's in a state-of-the-art drone, and she's about to commit, she's threatening to commit an act of eco-terrorism and release ca calcium carbonate into the atmosphere. This is an audience of climate geeks. It's geoengineering. Um, and in this scene, she's sort of beamed into the Oval Office where her ex-husband, played by Ed Norton, is trying to talk her out of it. So please take a look and roll the scene. Madam President, I'm sure Jonathan has told you about the bear and the lion. And, and maybe he's told you that what I'm doing is a reckless experiment that can only be done once. That's right, because but, it is. Okay, look, you, but, you don't know what's going to happen. Even if you get it right, what will happen to the ozone layer? You don't know. What will what, what, happen to the oceans? You don't know. With the two billion people you say you're, you're trying to save, you're about to drop another climate volatility event right on their heads. How, how does that But the happen? real reckless experiment is the one civilization has been running. Nobody was trying to change the climate. We, we didn't even think that we had that capacity. We, we didn't know better, but we do now. And yet, human behavior doesn't change. The sky is easier to re-engineer than the human brain, John. Exactly. And if, and if you tell that greedy monkey brain it's cooled off and everything's okay, it's going to say, give me a little bit more. Just let uh, me burn a little bit more. Just let, me, just let me mortgage a little more of the children's future so that I can make sure I can juice this quarterly balance sheet. I just need that one. It's, 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 Gita, Gita, even if you got all of, of the chemical interactions right, if you got the dispersal pattern right, the, the, the problem here is bigger than the heat of the sun, Gita. It's, it's the way we see the world. It, and, and, and you alone up in the plane with this technology, this is not going to solve the problem. Yeah, so says the problem. So it's a great scene, um, and it's one of, the, one of my favorite episodes in the, in the series. Um, <laughs> but I'll ask us a slightly provocative question here. I, can't, I, I couldn't help but detect, like through the, the course of the eight episodes, a certain skepticism in the show about technology and about entrepreneurs. Like one of the villains of the show is, is, is this nefarious billionaire or trillionaire played by Kit Harrington. Is that a fair reading of um, your intentions? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take that because I think Scott and I talked a lot yeah. about when we were making the show how we wanted to portray technology. Um, and I, I'll use an analogy because it's something that we all lived through, um, which is we had uh, recently a pandemic, uh, you may recall, and um, technology and scientists were incredibly important. And they made you know, an amazing vaccine. And that is an incredible achievement. We're all sitting here thanks to them. We're very grateful. Scientists and the vaccine could not alone just make sure that that vaccine was distributed in places that lacked refrigeration. Um, the vaccine as a technology could not make sure that it was not weaponized for political partisan end and an anti-vaccine campaign, you know, created to try to influence an election. Like those are things beyond the capacity of a technology itself. The technology is amazing, but the world has other things in it. And I think that's what we really wanted to say was that every technology is deployed by a group of people to a group of people and those the way those people receive it, distribute it, engage with it, politicize it that is a huge question, and the technology alone is insufficient to address those. Mm -hmm. One of the big themes in our show is the role of human institutions. We have an episode at the UN, we have an episode in a religious community, we have an episode in the White House, and I think we're asking, are the institutions that we've built as a society capable of responding and capable of using technology mm -hmm. and using entrepreneurship, but not being overrun by it? Um, and one of the reasons all those people in the White House are in that situation in that episode is because the government has not been able to act with sufficient speed and clarity to address the problem. So you get a rogue, you know, genius mm -hmm. threatening an act of eco-terrorism. That's a failure of civic society, right? So I, I, I think Scott and I, we like technology. You know, we love technology. We, we run around with technology all day. We had fun coming up with the technology in the show. We're not anti-technology. I don't think we're saying that we need to return to a pre-industrial mm -hmm. lifestyle and like live in a tent to solve climate change. But I also think we're saying that 
anything, whether it's you know, nuclear fission or a steam engine, can be deployed by good and evil people mm -hmm. to good and evil ends. Scott, do you want to get on that? Yeah. I have absolutely nothing to add to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I, yeah, that's, I mean, look, technology, and this is true going back again to an inconvenient truth. I mean, we have the solves, you know, everybody here knows that, that we can, in fact, solve this problem. The, you know, the, the reason why someone would pull me aside and go, yeah, but we're not going to, there are a lot of people making money off of being exactly the way it is. There are a lot of narratives that we've had drilled into our heads that we can't possibly change. They're way too big. Um, and so we continue. And, and also, there is a real, you know, and, and Edward talks about it with the monkey brain. Like, we have a really hard time, you know, looking very far into the future. There's a, a phrase I love, which is prognostic myopia. And we're not great at thinking very far ahead about the consequences of our actions. And we see that not just with climate change, but pretty much in every aspect of our lives. But I don't think for a minute that technology is, is the problem here. It's just a tool. You know, it can be used however we want. Yeah, you could use a hammer to build a house or to bash your neighbor's head in. Like, <laughs> the hammer is just there, and it depends on, you know, how you deploy it. I think like, the closing line in the show is the problem is never technology, it's ourselves, right? Um, so can I ask, like, what feelings, what thoughts are you hoping and trying to arouse in the viewer with this show? How do you want people to feel after watching it? You know, one of the great things about my job is I don't have to answer that question. <laughs> uh -huh. um, you know, I, and, and I, I, all joking aside, I think, you know, the artists in our society are here to tell stories, um, and we're, we're meant to come to them and feel. Um, and so uh, all, all we really wanted was to tell stories and, and have people react. So I, 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 I don't really want to tell you how I hope you feel. Um, what I do want to sort of underscore, however, is that you know, hope alone isn't getting us very far. We've been hoping that this will get better for a very long time. Um, so I think the characters, what we learn from them in our show, is those who act, those who lead, those who stand up against people um, who would have them behave otherwise. So courage, bravery, those are the things I would like to replace hope with. And those are the things I would like people to take out into, into the world with them. That and one other thing that we talk about quite a bit is we got to go to work every day in an environment where we spoke about climate change with grips, with gaffers, with our entire you know, crew. Going to work and talking about this is a huge, huge boon to your psychological well-being. And I believe it's really how the problem starts to get solved. It's when we put this away because we, again, are slaves to a narrative that I, I really hope people will question. That's when we lose. Um, and so that's more than anything. I think that's what we really want is for people to start talking about it with their kids, with their coworkers. Yeah. I think there's not one, one particular feeling, but I think we do want people to have all of the feelings. Um, there are episodes that are thrillers and they're exciting and you're wondering what's gonna happen next. There are episodes where you, you know, see attractive people kissing in their underpants. They're, they're all the feelings. Um, they're funny episodes, they're sad episodes, they're all of the feelings. And I think that's what we really want people to understand is that Climate change is something that is occurring. It will continue to occur. And we called the show Extrapolations. We didn't call it, this will definitely happen. There's nothing mm -hmm. you can do. Um, it is our guest about a potential future, but we still have the capacity to make different choices. This is a future if we keep muddling along current trends and don't get better. We made the show in 2021. And already in 2022, 
things happened that were different than the show predicted. So we're already on a different path. And I think our hope is that seeing this type of future gives us the courage to have the conversations that allow us to begin the processes to you know, make other choices so that by the time we arrive in 2059, people watch the show and go, oh, so off base. Great, that would be fabulous. <laughs> I said, Scott, I just want to pick up on one thing. Um, do you worry that the whole narrative around climate solutions, and I think there's one up right here, bringing climate solutions to life, that there's a risk that becomes a panacea just to make people feel better that something's being done, but actually the real work isn't being done? It's a really interesting dilemma that I think people face with the solution side of this. If you tell someone something is going to solve the problem and then it doesn't solve the problem, you as an expert have lost something with, with your audience. Um, and so I think we need to be careful in saying how big a solution is and, and sort of reframe it because if we, if we sell it like a panacea, then yeah, it does have a, a, a way of backfiring. If we look at it as a constellation of one, in, you know, a large constellation of possible solutions, then I think we we get closer to what is true mm -hmm. um, and and what is meaningful. I know when the Prius came out, I bought one and I was like, solved, did it, <laughs> done, which is how we felt when we made an inconvenient truth. But all we did, you know, was crack a door open. Um, and hopefully this show cracks the door open further, but I have no illusions that there aren't going to be more doors that are going to mm. need to be cracked open, but maybe it makes it easier for the next writers to, to open the door differently or open a different door. Um, so if we did that, then I feel like we did our job. We're nearly out of time, but I'd like to close by asking you each, um, to name another a book or an article or another show that inspired you, um, that you know that helped that inspired you and that helped sort of create the show. Um, I'll go first. Uh, so mine is Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home. Um, it is really great. It's not super long. If you haven't read it, if you are remotely interested in climate change, um, strong recommend. Um, it's a summary of how we got here and a vision of where we could go that I think is unsparing in its diagnosis of failures and flaws, but also contains a deep and abiding love for all people um, and all creatures on the earth. And it ends with a really beautiful prayer. Um, and I think it's something that's worth paying attention to. She, she gave me that book when we started, so <laughs> for sure that's a great one. I'll just say, and we don't have time, but Check out a, a book by an Indian author named Amitav Ghosh called The Great Derangement, mm. which really tells you a lot about what the artistic community needs to do to help people really understand the scope of this issue and how we find our way through it. Scott, um, Dorothy, thank you so much. Um, Apple, watch it on Apple TV. Well worth a watch. Really recommend it. Now, please, this is our last time, but please stay seated. Meg's Fabo is going to come on stage and give us some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.